This topic for biology is so, so fascinating. We are delving deep into genetics here. What makes you the special, amazing person that you are? If you want to follow through everything that I do in this video, you can use that doing the free vision guide from my website. The advantages of sexual reproduction is that you'll get a genetically diverse population. which means they're going to be better protected from diseases. The counter to that is that a disadvantage of asexual reproduction is that you're going to get a genetically identical population. So that if a disease comes along and one plant is susceptible, chances are all plants, the whole population, or animals are going to be susceptible and they're all going to be wiped out at once. An advantage of asexual reproduction is that there is only one parent, meaning that the plant or the animal doesn't have to wait around for a mate to turn up, whereas with sexual reproduction, a mate is required. And sometimes this can be quite hard to find, especially in sparsely populated locations. Another advantage of asexual reproduction is that there energy is conserved and what I mean by that is that the parent is putting all of its energy into conserving its own genes so this is like the selfish gene it wants its genes its genetics to be continued as opposed to continuing putting energy into something that only has half of its genes in mitosis we go from one parent cell to two identical daughter cells the first thing that needs to happen is that the DNA in the nucleus needs to condense into chromosomes and then they need to line up down the middle. Once they're all lined up down the middle and all the checks are taken place to make sure that um, chromosomes aren't going to go astray, they can start to be pulled apart to either end of the cell. New nuclei will form and then they will separate into two identical daughter cells. In meiosis, we are going to have two divisions. So our chromosomes will line up, they will sort themselves down the middle, there will be a little bit of crossing over going on. So they will swap chunks of their chromosome to increase the genetic diversity. They will divide into two, then they will line up and divide into two again. And you'll notice that each of the cells has half the number of DNA as the parent cell. Mitosis will lead to two identical daughter cells, whereas meiosis will lead to four different daughter cells. You can remember mitosis goes to T because it has a T in it. Mitosis is used for things like growth or repair, whereas meiosis is used for sexual reproduction. So these are going to be gametes. In mitosis, we are going to end up with diploid cells. And in meiosis, we are going to end up with haploid cells. Haploid cells having half the number of DNA as the original cell. In women, the gametes are eggs. And in men, the gametes are sperm. In a plant, we have eggs still, and that is in the stigma. And then the male gametes in um, plants are pollen, and that is on the stamen. DNA is, I think, surprisingly easy to get your hands on. You might have done this in class using DNA, getting DNA out of fruit or peas is a really, really common one. 
first thing you need to do is mash up, um, I'm going to say peas, just because that's what I've got a picture of, but it's basically whatever you're testing. Add salt water. Add detergents. Leave it for 15 minutes at 60 degrees C. Filter it. Add iced ethanol. And the DNA should float to the top and it will look like um, white stringy, like you've uh, put cotton wool in water. DNA is made from different bases that fit together. So we are always going to have A connecting to T and we are always going to have C connecting to G. This is always, always, always going to be the case. It has a sugar phosphate backbone and there are two of those which stretch all the way around the outside. There are two of those, it is a double helix. You see that the green is always connected to the yellow, A to T, C to G, the blue is always connected to the orange and it's going round in a helical or a double helical structure. DNA is a long strand of deoxyribonucleic acid made up of lots of letters, A's, T's, C's and G's. And these twist round into a double helix. This double helix is still ridiculously long, so it further twists round so that it's in a chromosome. And this chromosome is located in the nucleus of a cell. Gene is a stretch of DNA that codes for a characteristic. Genome is all the genes in a body, or all of the genes that you have. Each three letter sequence of DNA is going to code for an amino acid. So here we have A, G, A. We start off with A, find G, then find A. So that's DNA sequence is going to code into the amino acid arginine. The next three along, C, T, G, are going to code into leucine. And this will keep going until eventually we have a long amino acid chain. This can then fold up in very complicated ways until we get a protein that will look something like that. And proteins are responsible for basically everything that happens in your body. They are the hormones, they are the enzyme, they are the cell walls. Everything is a protein or dependent upon a protein. And these proteins are very, very specific. An enzyme substrate active site is going to be very, very specific to the substrate. So if there is a mistake in our amino acid chain, if something is missing or if something is wrong, we put the wrong amino acid in there, then our enzyme, our protein, is going to fold up wrong. The mutation is going to have caused a change in the protein, which can then have a massive impact on how it functions. Meaning that it might not work properly, meaning that it might not break down what it's supposed to break down, meaning that it might not function in the correct way. There is a massive amount of DNA in each of our cells and only some of it is useful. So say this section here might be non-coding. Which basically means it's like junk DNA just getting in the way. 
a gamete is going to be a sex cell, so in um, humans that is a sperm or other egg. Chromosome is bundled up DNA. Alleles are different versions of genes. Dominant means you will need one gene to express a characteristic. Recessive means you need two identical recessive genes to express a characteristic. Homozygous means your genes are the same. Heterozygous means your genes are different. Genotype is what genes you have. And phenotype is a collection of characteristics that you have. We can work out the chances of a disease or a phenotype being passed on by doing a genetic cross. These are one of the things that I think should be laid out very formally and very properly. So mother's genotype, big R, little r. Mother's phenotype is a carrier. Father's phenotype, big R, little r. Father's phenotype, a carrier. Mother's gametes, R, 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 R. Now we can move the mother's gametes over here, R, R. And the father's down here, R. R, and then fill in these ones down and these ones across. So the mother, R, R, then this one down, R, R, the father, this one across, R, R, and then for the father, this one across. R, R. Then the offspring are going to have dominant, dominant. So they're going to be homozygous and a non sufferer. Two of the potential offspring, or half the potential offspring, are going to be heterozygous and a carrier. And then out of the offspring, one in four of them has a chance of being double homozygous, recessive, and being a sufferer. Polydactyly is a condition where the people get one, two, three, four, five, six little adorable baby fingers. And it is dominant. So here we have a mother who has two homozygous recessive and five fingers and a father who has a dominant and a recessive and has six fingers. We can feel in the genetic cross, mother, 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 father, father, father. Father, and we can see somebody who has this dominant disease. If they have um, one gene, they will pass it on, and 50 or that offspring has a 50% chance of also having polydactyly. Cystic fibrosis is a recessive disease. So, as we saw in the first example, if we have two parents that are carriers, there is a one in four chance of an offspring having the disease. If um, only one parent is a carrier, then the chance of the baby having um, a sister basis are virtually nothing, apart from brand new mutation, and the chance of them being a carrier are 50%. Your chromosomes are in the nucleus and you have 23 pairs.
So that is 46 in total. I say 23 pairs because you're going to get one copy from your mother and one copy from your father. So you'll have two copies of chromosome 1, two copies of chromosome 2, two copies of chromosome 3, two copies of chromosome 4. One from your mother and one from your father. This will allow for you to be homozygous or heterozygous for dominant or recessive genes. If you have inherited two X chromosomes, you're going to be genetically female. If you have inherited an X and a Y chromosome, you're going to be genetically male. Genetics will determine your blood group, and in blood groups, A and B are both dominant, whereas O is recessive. So if your blood group is A, you are either going to have two dominant A genes, or you're going to have a dominant A gene and a recessive O gene. If your blood group is B, there is either going to be two dominant B genes, or a dominant B gene and a recessive O gene. If your blood group is AB, you're going to have a dominant A gene and a dominant B gene. Whereas if your blood group is O, you're going to have two recessive O genes. To make this further complicated, there are also positives and negatives. It is important that you know your blood group or that blood group is, re I mean, blood group is really easy to work out in hospital. So that we can determine, or doctors can determine what blood you can receive. People with an A blood group can receive from A or O. People with a B blood group can receive from people who are B or O. People who are AB can receive from A donors, B donors, AB donors or O donors. And people that are blood group O can receive only blood group O. There are some phenotypes apart from sex which are sex linked. For example, haemophilia, the gene that causes or lends in haemophilia, is on the X chromosome. Whereas females have two X chromosomes, they're much more likely to have a dominant and a recessive gene. If a male inherits the recessive gene for haemophilia, they have no corresponding dominant gene because they only have one X chromosome. If you know a pair of identical twins, you'll know that they are not exactly the same, even though their genotypes are the same. While they have identical genes, their phenotypes, their characteristics and how they look are going to be very different. Because your phenotype is influenced by lots of different things. Firstly, your genotype. So that's your DNA, your genetic information and your environment. This is going to lead to natural variation in a population. Things that are going to lead to variation in a population are going to be influences like diet, exercise and personal choice. The aim of the Human Genome Project was to determine the sequence of base pairs in a human genome. That's a lot of work because there's roughly 3 billion pairs. They wanted to find all the genes and they wanted to develop faster ways of sequencing in the future. The first time it was done, it took an incredibly long time and cost a large amount of money and it was finished in 2001. But they did a really good job of finding faster ways to sequence in the future. It is now not as big a job. It's still quite a lot of work, but it costs roughly £500 to get someone's genome sequenced. And this is paving the way for large advances, very fast advances in personalised medicine. So that if you develop something awful like cancer or another genetic disease, they can tailor the treatment that they give you exactly to what your genome needs.